So I'm very happy to be here to discuss the relationship between my father and Martin Luther King Jr. It's especially important for me personally because we're coming up in a few months on the 50th anniversary of the March in Selma. Some of you may have been to Selma, I think, perhaps. Some people, yes. If you haven't, it's, uh, it's something you should do. Go to Selma. Uh, there's now actually a museum that is a collection of the photographs taken by the Alabama State Police thousands and thousands of photographs that they took, not because they wanted to make a documentary of the Civil Rights Movement, but of course because they wanted to take pictures of the terrible acts that were being committed in those days. And I think when you go to Selma, you might also see the Pettus Bridge and uh, imagine for yourselves what took place there in 1965 during that march. So I'm here because I want to talk a bit about my father's relationship with Martin Luther King, what it means for us as Jews, what it means for us as Americans, for the civil rights movement, and what Martin Luther King did for us as a Jewish community, what he did to transform us as Jews, for which we're very grateful. I'm going to begin with this picture, which maybe some of you recognize. It's a 19th century painting by Moritz Oppenheimer of the relationship between two important figures in Berlin in the 18th century. Does anybody recognize, by chance, these people? This is, uh, on the one hand, we have um, Moses Mendelssohn on the left with his friend Gotthold Lessing on the right. Moses Mendelssohn lived in Berlin in the late 18th century during the period of the German Enlightenment. He was a brilliant philosopher. He actually won first prize once in a contest in which Kant won second prize. So if any of you ever win second prize, don't feel bad. <laughs> Even Kant once won a second prize. So he was here in conversation with his good friend, Gotthold Lessing. Lessing was a Christian theologian, a Protestant theologian, very brilliant, very extraordinary, and a philosopher, and a writer. He wrote a play called Nathan the Wise, a play that is read, required reading of every high school kid in Germany to this very day. It's a play that he wrote against The Merchant of Venice by Shakespeare. He wrote about Moses Mendelssohn as Nathan instead of Shylock, yeah, the negative figure of Shylock. He wrote about Moses Mendelssohn as his good friend, as a noble human being, a person of wisdom, generosity, a person of great moral courage and, um, uh, and judgment, great moral judgment. And the play about Nathan the Wise is set actually in Palestine during Islamic rule, the rule of, uh, of Saladin. And it's a play about how the three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, can live together, one with the other. It's a play about tolerance. The relationship between Moses Mendelssohn, who was an Orthodox Jew, a philosopher, and Lessing, was something that was famous all over Europe, that a Jew and a Christian could be friends. They could sit together, discuss philosophy, drink tea, play chess. You see, there's a woman. There's also a woman. You see? see? Oh, they're women. They're women. She's bringing tea. See? Women have their place. See? So there's a woman <laughs> bringing in the tray of tea. <laughs> it reminds me of my childhood, but OK. So <laughs> this relationship was something extraordinary. And you have to ask ourselves, now why is it so extraordinary? First of all, because these were two brilliant men who wrote very important and influential work. But it's the friendship itself that's so important. And I have to tell you something. In 1988, I happened to be in Berlin on the 9th of November, which was the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night that the Nazis burned down all the synagogues and beat Jews and raped Jews and destroyed Jewish property all over Germany. It's called crystal night because they broke the shop windows of so many Jewish-owned shops that ended up costing millions and millions, I think it was half the annual production of glass for a year, yeah, of these windows. At any rate, it was the 50th anniversary in Germany, and the great uh, professor Walter Jens from the University of Tübingen came to give the major lecture in Berlin, and I was lucky enough to get a ticket through a friend who was a journalist, and I went to this lecture. What is Walter Jens going to speak about on the 50th anniversary of Kristallnacht here in Berlin? And he spoke about this friendship between Mendelssohn and Lessing. It was deeply moving. It was a, he spoke about their relationship as a banner for all Germans to follow. On the other hand, I thought, my goodness, that was in the 18th century. Here we are, it was 1988, and that's all he could come up with. He had to go all the way back to the 18th century to find a friendship between a German and a Jew, to find something positive for Germans to identify with. I was a little uncomfortable, I have to say, with that. But nonetheless, that relationship to this day stands as something extraordinary. And I think 
It's also true for many Jews about the relationship between my father and Martin Luther King. They were close friends. They met for the first time in Chicago in 1963 at a conference about religion and race. Two words, my father said, that should never be uttered in the same breath. It was a conference organized by the National Conference of Christians and Jews, a very wonderful organization. And when they met, you know, I'm sure it's happened to all of us. Sometimes you meet someone and it just, you click, you bond. You know this is a soulmate. This becomes your good friend. And so it was with them. They became very close, always. And their friendship also stood as a banner to be invoked in the 1980s by Reverend Jesse Jackson. When he went to the National Democratic Convention and gave a speech apologizing for a remark he had made, he said, let's remember the friendship between Martin Luther King and Abraham Joshua Heschel. They're calling out to us from their graves about friendship, reconciliation, forgiveness. Now, my question is about that relationship and why it has meant so much to us. And I want to begin with the opening of my father's lecture at that occasion in Chicago in 1963. At the first conference on religion and race, the main participants were Pharaoh and Moses. <laughs> Moses' words were, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me. While Pharaoh retorted, who is the Lord that I should heed this voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. Moreover, I will not let Israel go. Notice, first of all, the Bible present here in this moment, as it was in Martin Luther King's words and throughout the Civil Rights Movement. My father went on in very passionate language. Few of us seem to realize how insidious, how radical, how universal and evil racism is. Few of us realize that racism is man's greatest threat to man, the maximum of hatred for a minimum of reason, the maximum of cruelty for a minimum of thinking. Racism is an eye disease, a cancer of the soul. The problem is how to stop the profanation of God's name by dishonoring Negroes. Racism is an evil of tremendous power but God's will transcends all powers. To surrender to despair is to surrender to evil. It is important to feel anxiety. It is sinful to wallow in despair. Now, I want to put this into context. My father was born in 1907 in Warsaw. He was born to a very deeply religious family, a family of Hasidic Rebbe's, very famous Hasidic Rebbe's, people who devoted their lives, not just to being a rabbi, but a rebbe, meaning someone who really cared for the community in a very profound way. Someone who was a tzaddik, a righteous person, to whom others went with all of their troubles. My father was born into a very noble family, but what he said was, when he was growing up among these pious Jews in Warsaw, he felt he was surrounded by people of religious nobility. And I think that's an important phrase, religious nobility. Think about it. What would that mean, religious nobility? And what would it mean for us today if we want our children to grow up surrounded by people of religious nobility? Let me give you an example of a Rebbe. My father was named for one of his ancestors who lived in Ukraine, who died in 1825. His name was Abraham Joshua Heschel. And he was. Beloved, beloved, and people would flock to him all day, every day, come to him for some comfort, to ask him to pray for a sick child or because they lost their job and they didn't know what to do. And he would comfort them and he would pray for them. And one day, the story goes, his assistant came to him and asked him, so many people come to you all day with their problems. How do you remember the name of the person and what the problem is? How do you remember when to, to pray for whom and what? And he said, you don't understand. When someone comes to me and they pour out their sorrows, I open my heart. And their troubles come into my heart and they make a scar. And when I go to pray, I open my heart and I say, look, God, at all these scars. 
Now, I tell you this story because my father used to talk about this story often and about other ancestors of his. And I tell it to you to illustrate the kind of profound compassion that's embodied by the figure of a Hasidic Rebbe, and that I think was embodied by my father, by Martin Luther King, by all those who participated in the civil rights movement who put their lives on the line for all of us, for the society. And because I think each one of us probably knows what it feels like to talk to somebody who listens to us in that way. I, I know the times when I've gone to a friend and I've said, I'm so upset about something, and I tell them, and I can see they're only half listening. I remember once when I was in graduate school telling a friend about what I thought was going to be a calamity, and he said, well, you know, stiff upper lip. And I thought, oh, boy. <laughs> And I think some of us are lucky enough to know what it's like to talk to somebody who listens in a way where you feel, yeah, in fact, the heart is open to me, and my trouble is making a scar inside of that heart. And you know what that feels like, and you know how precious that is, and what a gift that is. So I think that's what the Hasidic movement, in part, was striving for. People were looking for a Rebbe like that. And I think all of us do. So my father came from that world. He lived in a very impoverished neighborhood. My father's father uh, had grown up in a very comfortable circumstance and decided to move to Warsaw from uh, Sadegera and live, he, deliberately he chose, in the most impoverished neighborhood, Jewish neighborhood in Warsaw. When my father was nine, his father died and the family was in bad shape. My father decided that even though he was expected to become a Hasidic Rebbe himself, that he wanted to study. He went to Vilna for a year, and then he went to Berlin. And Berlin, in 1927, when my father was 20 years old, my father said it was like the intellectual center of the universe. It was so exciting. Berlin in the 20s, great philosophers and thinkers and writers and musicians and artists so much going on, and he went to concerts and theater, and he went to lectures. He studied at the University of Berlin and did his PhD, but he also went to the Reform Rabbinical School and to the Orthodox Rabbinical School. Nobody did that. It was one or the other. They didn't talk to each other. You're either your, your Reform or your Orthodox, yeah, one or the other. And by the way, this is funny. Those two seminaries that didn't talk to each other, the name of the street they were on was Artillery Street. Oh. Isn't that perfect? Yeah. But my father went to both. He was open to everything. He was himself very religious, orthodox, but he wanted to know what's, what are the liberals also thinking. He was open to all expressions of Judaism and not stuck in just one. He finished his PhD just a few weeks before Hitler came to power. And then things got very difficult for him. They wouldn't grant him the degree until three years later for a variety of reasons. Finally, he was trying to get out of Europe to save his life, and he couldn't find a place until finally, at the last minute, a few weeks before the Nazis invaded Poland, where he was, had returned to see his mother, he managed to escape. He came to this country in March of 1940. His mother and three of his sisters were killed, as were other members of his family. He had good friends. His whole world was wiped out. When my father was in Germany, imagine this, there were Christian theologians who supported Hitler. There were Christian theologians running around saying that the Old Testament is a Jewish book and has no place in the Christian Bible. Throw it out. They wrote their own version of the New Testament, and they purged any positive reference of Jesus going to the synagogue or saying anything nice about Jews. Took it out. They said that Jesus wasn't a Jew at all. He was an Aryan, yeah, like a German, a Nazi, and that Hitler was doing what Jesus had started fulfilling his work. So imagine living in that kind of an environment for those years, and then coming to the United States and meeting Christian theologians like Reinhold Niebuhr, who a great Protestant theologian, an ethicist who put the Old Testament right at the center of his theology, or meeting Martin Luther King, who made the exodus the central motif of the civil rights movement. It was extraordinary for my father. My father became a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. It was a seminary for training rabbis. In fact, <laughs> we have one of them right here, Becky. And two of them, sorry, Jeff also, <laughs> from the Jewish Theological Seminary. 
But you know, you look at this essay from 1963 and you see the passion in it. The theologian James Cone, C-O-N-E, Cone from Union Theological Seminary recently wrote a book called The Lynching Tree. And he compared my father and Reinhold Niebuhr. Both of them spoke out against racism, but Niebuhr's language was very dry. My father's, he points out, is very passionate, very emotional. It was only after Reinhold Niebuhr met James Baldwin and entered into dialogue with him that Niebuhr's language became passionate against racism. And I just have to tell you, my father never met James Baldwin. And teaching at a Jewish seminary, he had no African-American colleagues either. But nonetheless, he spoke with passion. Spoke with passion as a religious human being, as a person who had written his doctoral dissertation on the prophets on prophetic experience. He went on, my father, to speak further about issues of race. I'll just leave this up here for you to look at if you'd like. This was in a period, a year later, when people were saying, it's enough already with the civil rights movement. We've had enough. And my father spoke with great irony. And I think the trope of irony is very interesting, especially in the prophetic books of the Old Testament, how irony is used you say something with a little humor that you mean very earnestly. Yeah. So here my father's talking about the exodus from Egypt. Three days after the exodus, the Israelites are complaining. They want to go back to Egypt. They miss the food. And he's talking to Americans, to white Americans. Look at this. What shall we drink? We want out of How ordinary, how unpoetic, how annoying. Yeah. After my father and Martin Luther King came to know each other, they began to collaborate in various ways and different projects. And it was in 1965. Uh, Dr. King was given various awards from Jewish organizations, and because of their friendship, my father was often asked to present it. And he introduced Martin Luther King with this language, the glory of God is concealed, yet there are moments in which it is revealed. What is the nature of the glory? Moses, in his great petition, called upon God. Remember in the book of Exodus? Show me, I pray thee, thy glory. And his petition was granted. The Lord, the Lord, God, merciful and gracious, abundant in goodness and truth. The glory of God is concealed, yet there are moments in which it is revealed. We sense a glimpse of the glory in the life of Martin Luther King, and we honor him because his words and his deeds are a marvelous glorification of God, who is merciful and gracious. Sacred and magnificent is the work he does for all of us in America. At the same time, the scope of God's glory is the whole world, all of humanity. Now, as you know, the presidents of the United States were a little bit bewildered at times by the civil rights movement. President John F. Kennedy sent a telegram to my father asking him to participate in a meeting of civil rights leaders at the White House. But you know, President Kennedy's record on civil rights is, shall we say gently, a mixed record. And Taylor Branch, among others, has written about this. Now my father, and I'll just, this, the, this is the copy of the telegram, but I'll give you the text on the other side. Or maybe you could read it from here. I look forward to privilege of being president meeting tomorrow, 4 PM. This is called telegram language. I don't think we have telegrams. I don't know how many students know about telegram language. <laughs> yeah, we have texting language now. That's right, with the thumbs, yeah. <laughs> so he wrote back to the president, likelihood exists that Negro problem will be like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. Please demand of religious leaders personal involvement, not just solemn declaration. We forfeit right to worship God as long as we continue to humiliate Negroes. The church, synagogue have failed. They must repent. 
ask of religious leaders to call for national repentance and personal sacrifice. Let religious leaders donate one month's salary toward fund for Negro housing and education. I propose that you, Mr. President, declare state of moral emergency. A Marshall Plan for aid to Negroes is becoming a necessity. The hour calls for moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. My father's involvement led to the, his participation in the march in Selma, and I'll just say a word about what it was like at that moment. I think all of you are aware of what happened when the effort was made first to march out of Selma. It was a day that came to be known as Bloody Sunday. If you've been to Selma, you know that the Pettus Bridge, which is named for a Confederate general, is a curved bridge. By the way, when I was in Selma for the first time in the year 2000, it turns out that Joseph Smitherman, who was the mayor in 1965, was still the mayor in the year 2000, by the way. And not a whole lot seemed to have changed in downtown Selma at that point. Five years later, it was a little bit different. At any rate, the bridge is curved. And what that means is that the marchers were leaving Selma and started walking up the bridge. But it was only when they came to the crest of the bridge that they saw what was waiting at the other end. The Alabama state troopers dressed up with gas masks and riot gear and clubs who immediately charged the marchers and threw tear gas and beat them. You know that Representative John Lewis was beaten bloody that day too. OK, so it was a very dangerous time. We, uh, we had a small television, black and white, and we used to watch, like everybody else, these scenes from Birmingham, for example, and elsewhere in the South of beatings and water cannon and horrors that were going on. When I was a child, my father talked to me about it very much in personal terms. He talked about what was being done in the United States to black people and what was done to Jews that he had seen in Europe, what he had experienced before the war in Warsaw, the poverty and the ingrained entrenched poverty, the deliberate, the deliberate institutionalization of, property, of poverty that you couldn't get out of it. You couldn't get out of it. I grew up in New York City uh, on 115th Street um, not too far from Harlem. And in those days, it wasn't just a television uh, news broadcast of what was going on. It was a conversation with my parents very frequently. But the telegram came on a Friday afternoon from Dr. King asking my father to join the march on Sunday. There had been a federal order from a federal judge uh, for protection of the marchers. And it was a very busy Friday afternoon in March. We were getting ready for the Sabbath, and we had to make a plane reservation before the Sabbath and pack a suitcase before the Sabbath. And then the Sabbath came, and it was a kind of a nervous Sabbath for us. When it was over and we said the blessing, Havdalah, at the end, that night, Saturday night, my mother and I went downstairs with my father in the elevator. And I remember quite vividly that moment when he kissed me goodbye and turned around and walked to get into the taxi to go to the airport. And I remember it so vividly because I made a point of having it stick in my mind because I thought I may never see him again. It was a dangerous time. He went to Selma and he was there with other marchers here in the front line. There was someone who came from Hawaii and brought lays for some of the marchers. Um, you can see John Lewis here. There was a group of sisters who came from St. Louis, and there is actually a film, a documentary, about this convent of sisters who came. Uh, sisters at Selma, it's called. Uh, Ralph Abernathy and Dr. King, Ralph Bunch. And my father is um, the one with the white hair and the beard over here. And then on the far right, um, that's one of the great human beings I've ever met, Reverend C.T. Vivian whom I just saw again recently, an extraordinary person. At any rate, my father was there, and then he came home from Selma. And he wrote a little diary, and he talked to us about it. He said, 
He said he felt a sense of holiness in that march. It reminded him of walking with Hasidic rebbies in Europe. He said that the Dr. King told him it was the greatest day of his life. My father said he felt his legs were praying. That's where the title of this lecture comes from. He also told me about a little boy who came over to him and said, are you Santa Claus? <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, my father hated to go to the barber because it was so time consuming when he could be studying and writing and working and why take the time to go to the barber? So his hair was usually kind of, yeah. <laughs> my mother used to joke and say that she thought hippies grew beards because of my father's beard. But <laughs> so my father came back from that historic moment and I think it changed his life. Changed his life because he suddenly decided that he was going to do something on a bigger scale. He had been speaking out on behalf of Soviet Jews. He had talked, uh, spoke out, spoken out against the Korean War. He had spoken out also against the war in Vietnam. But shortly after, my father formed an organization, shortly after Selma, in the fall of 1963, called Clergy and Laymen Concerned About Vietnam, an anti-war organization. He formed it this way, a group of his friends, four or five people, and clergy from different denominations called a press conference to speak out against the war. At the end of the press conference, a newspaper reporter said, well, this is all very nice, but now what are you gonna do? My father said, we're forming an organization of clergy and laymen against the war, and the others looked at him. <laughs> we are? <laughs> One of the things they did was to hold a demonstration here at Arlington National Cemetery. Oops. Well, this is my father with his brother-in-law, who was a Hasidic Rebbe. So here they are at Arlington. They actually asked the United States government to hold a demonstration at Arlington, and the government said no. So then they asked if they could have a prayer service, and the government said yes, finally. So they had a prayer service, and each one was allowed to recite one line from a psalm. My father's line from a psalm was, Eli, Eli, lama azavtani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's in Hebrew, and it's a line from the Psalms, yes? You know where the Psalms are in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament. But a newspaper reporter also recognized that Jesus said it. So he wrote in the Newsweek magazine that my father quoted Jesus. <laughs> and he had to explain, you know, Jesus quoted the psalm, and I also quoted the psalm. Okay. At this demonstration at Arlington, Rabbi Maurice Eisendroth, who was the head of the reform movement, brought a Torah scroll. I don't know, actually, you can see here on the far right, Andrew Young, and next to him, the man who's a little bald, that's Rabbi Everett Gendler. This was a press conference, again, to discuss the war and to discuss issues of race. And this man is Albert Clegg. I don't know if that name is familiar to any of you. He was a pastor in Detroit who wrote a book uh, on black Jesus, black Messiah, uh, which was considered very radical in its day. Read it. It's perfectly reasonable. I don't know why someone would call it a radical book, but I think the fact that it was labeled radical, first of all, tells you something about the mentality of that era. But also, I want you to see that my father talked to lots of people from all spectrums and never closed himself off from people. And I think that's an important lesson for all of us. Now, this organization, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam, decided that it was very important with Dr. King to speak out publicly against the war. It was, it was a very big issue, a, great, a grave moral issue in 1967. This is a photograph of Dr. King at Riverside Church. But it was a grave issue in this sense. What would it do to the civil rights movement if Dr. King spoke out against the war? How would Congress retaliate? How would President Johnson retaliate? What would happen? What I remember so vividly from my childhood is that these political questions were framed as moral questions. Yes, there was a politics to it, but it was a moral issue. 
I actually remember going to school as a child and at lunch talking to my friends. What is our moral responsibility if we encourage Dr. King to speak out against the war and something bad happens to the civil rights movement? What's our moral responsibility? Politics was about morality in a way that I'm afraid sometimes we neglect today. So Dr. King spoke out against the war at Riverside Church. I was there that evening. It was a great moment and a very frightful moment. It was exactly, by the way, one year to the day before he was assassinated. But he spoke out in a wonderful speech, and there's a documentary about that speech that was made by Tavis Smiley about two, three years ago, and that I think is still available on the internet, and I urge you to look at it, because this speech was a speech about America, and it's a, one of King, Dr. King's great speeches that is terribly neglected because he was indeed very critical of the militarism of this country and of the economic exploitation in this country. Have any of you read that speech ever in Riverside Church? Yeah. You remember the motto of the SCLC, to save the soul of America? That's what this speech was about. America needs to save its soul. As you probably also know, Dr. King was criticized bitterly for this speech. You know that by other civil rights leaders, by congressmen, as one might expect. And now I want to take you to 1968. There was a convention at the Concord Hotel, which no longer exists. It was in the Catskill Mountains in New York. It was a kosher hotel where there used to be conventions of Jews of different kind of rabbis and so forth. This was a convention of conservative rabbis. It was held in March of 1968. They were honoring my father, and they invited Dr. King to give the keynote address. It was a great occasion. Here he is arriving, and these are, um, yeah, all right. My father on the right, and Dr. King on the left, and here he is speaking at the Concord. When Dr. King entered the room, the lecture room, it was after dinner, there were a thousand of us in the room who stood up and linked arms like this and sang, we shall overcome in Hebrew. And Dr. King said, I've heard we shall overcome all over the world in so many languages, never before in Hebrew. It was an extraordinary moment. And he gave a great speech that night and spoke with my father to members of the press. Let's talk about what this means. For Dr. King, the civil rights movement was very much about the Bible. And it was for my father as well. My father wrote his doctoral dissertation on the prophets in German back in 1932 in Germany, in Berlin. But then later in the early 1960s, he revised it and translated it into English and expanded it. And he wrote about what it means to be a prophet. And he felt, my father, that Dr. King exemplified what it is to be a prophet. Who is a prophet? A prophet is stirred by an intimate concern for the divine concern. What does that mean? Both my father and Dr. King used similar language to speak about God. They both, in their speeches, they both said, God is not the unmoved mover of Aristotle. You know, the unmoved mover of Aristotle, the God sort of sets things in motion, makes them go, but nothing changes God. God doesn't change. God is not affected by anything. But Dr. King and my father said, no, the God of the Bible is not the unmoved mover, but the most moved mover. That is, God is affected by human beings. It says in the Bible, if you give something good, if you help another person, you give strength to God. If you injure another human being, you hurt God. That's a very strong tradition in Jewish theology that my father wrote about. And so there is a divine concern for human beings. And you know, just think about it for a moment. A divine concern for human beings. We, human beings, are an object of divine concern. That God cares about us, all of us. To be a prophet means to identify one's concern with the concern of God. The prophet is a person who is inwardly transformed. 
His interior life is formed by the pathos of God. It is theomorphic. The prophet holds God and man in one thought at one time. The prophet holds human concern and divine concern together. What kind of a person is a prophet? The prophet is a man who feels fiercely. God has thrust a burden upon his soul and he is bowed and stunned at man's fierce greed. Think about the prophet Amos. Think about the words of the prophet. Dr. King used to quote the prophets, and sometimes you didn't know were they his words, the prophet's words, they blended so beautifully. Frightful is the agony of man. No human voice can convey its full terror. Prophecy is the voice that God has lent to the silent agony, a voice to the plundered poor, to the profane riches of the world. It is a form of living, a crossing point of God and man. God is raging in the prophet's words. My father used to say that in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. That is his prophetic teaching. It was only 10 days after that great moment at the Concord Hotel that Dr. King was assassinated, as you know, in Memphis. My father flew to Memphis and participated in that march, and then my mother and I joined him in Atlanta for the funeral where he spoke. This is at Morehouse College. This is again Dr. King at Riverside Church and at Selma. I want to conclude by again putting something into into context. And finally, I'm going to just play for you for a moment some words, but not quite yet. <laughs> OK. I need help with computers. I'm, mm. You know, there are two things I want to, to call to your attention that I think are worth thinking about. My father came from Europe. He lost his family. His mother, three sisters, murdered, extended family. The question is, what do you do with that? What do you do with that knowledge, with that experience? My father used to say there are three ways to respond to grief. You can cry, you can be silent, or you can turn your sorrow into a song. The question that faced my father and other Jews of his generation was, how do you respond when there's been this terrible murder and destruction? You can respond by saying, never again to the Jewish people. And you can respond by saying, never again to any human being. My father chose the latter. There was a choice in the 1960s. There were Jews who were ardently right wing, such as Mayor Kahana, who said, we Jews should be like the Black Panthers. We should look for power and stay away from anybody who isn't Jewish, make our own state, that's it. He had black power envy. My father turned to Martin Luther King, a person of extraordinary dignity, of extraordinary religiosity, truly a prophet. And that's what he did with his experience. But there is, in fact, finally something else. What is it to be a religious person? My father rarely spoke rarely, rarely spoke about his experiences in Europe, about the Nazis, about the terrible tragedies. It was, in fact, too painful for him to talk too, too often about what happened to his family. But he drew the lesson very clearly. And the lesson that he drew was a lesson for all human beings. And I'm going to play for you as he speaks these words that you see here. He speaks them in Yiddish, and he said this at a gathering with Martin Luther King. It was also in 1963, a few months after they first met, when Dr. King came again to the Concord Hotel for a different convention, Jewish convention, and they both spoke about the issues of the day, about racism, about the persecution of Jews in the Soviet Union, about economic exploitation. And my father concluded with these words. So if you can... And here's the translation. Eat the sin we have committed, and let us not let the rest 
vanish. I would like to spend the next three minutes by saying to you just a few words in Yiddish in honor of the Russian Jews, most of whom still speak Yiddish. I'd like to say something about our inner situation in relation to what happened in our times in the early 40s. Mir fiel noch als dem Sätze über den Kopf. Es ducht sich, als der Himmel über uns zerfällt in Sticker. Mir haben noch als die Teufels gewesen, dem Bruch und das Unglück, was hat uns getroffen. Mir sind noch als wie Fahr der Lawaie. Noch nicht gerät sich setzen Schiffe. Zu tummelt, zu brochen, zu mischten, versteinert. Oft dacht sich mir, als wir alle leben in Neuland Matoyu. Mir praven unsere Simches, aber es ist wie ein Hassen auf Abesäulam. Ungelumpert, grotesk ist unser Naches, die Eulam Hasedeke Hanoes. Verbrennt ist geworden unser Volk. In die Welt bleibt der Welt. Der Asch von menschlichen Beine geht nicht von sich kein Reier. Der Ave von der Welt ist nicht versammt. Unser Bräut ist frisch, unser Zucker süß. Das Geschrei von Millionen in Krematorius hat sich keinmal nicht getrogen auf die Qualles von Radio. Scha, still, es ist gar nicht geschehen. Lebt noch in unser Herz, ist das Herz geworden stehen. Oft sitze ich und tracht. Efscher sind in unseren Nischumis verbrennt geworden, zusammen mit Seri Gufim in Maidanik und in Auschwitz. Mischuge gottlos ist unsere Welt. In mir jeden tanzen herum, der Mägel Azov. Wir vergessen, dass wir leben in einer treffenden Welt. Finster ist unser Kufe, in mir zinden auf viele nicht tun, die Schabes dicke Licht. Sechs Millionen Jeden sind in der Weg mit dem Reuch. Blut schweigt nicht, aber unser Gewissen ist stumm wie eine Wand. Verschickert, vertummelt sind in mir mit den Stüssen von der Welt. Sei dicke Deutschem darf nicht unser Kaddisch, aber Efscher darf mir so ein Kaddisch nach uns. Vor uns, weil wir haben Efscher verloren, den ich schon ist. Ich will sich nicht einmal rüberreden von Herzen. Mit so einem Kind ist, will mir nicht heute zu sein. In so Aufgabe ist nichts zu schlagen, Kopf und Wand. In so Aufgabe ist zu gefinden ein Impfer. Ein Impfer auf eine geröldige Frage. Was ist der Heu von einem Itztigen da? What is the task? Not to forget. Never to be indifferent to other people's suffering. Thank you. Never to be indifferent to other people suffering. That for him was the central message, and I think that was without question the central message of Martin Luther King, never to be indifferent. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take some questions from you. There are a microphone at either end if you'd like to use it. Um, please feel free to ask anything you'd like. Yes. You know, it's a little hard to hear. Shall I start again? Beep, beep. Yeah, it's on. So Tavis Smiley has just published a new book on the last year of Martin Luther yeah. King's life. Is this thing working? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Tavis Smiley has just published his book, Death of a King. It's about the last year of King's life. I just read it the other day. Wonderful book. It begins on the day that King came out against 
the Vietnam War. From that day until he died, almost everyone turned against him, including his colleagues, many of the people who had supported him uh, in the Civil Rights Movement. And it's, it's a wonderful book. Tavis Smiley uh, said he wrote it because he had always been fascinated by King. Smiley, I think, was born after King's death, but uh, let me recommend the book to anybody who's interested in that era. It's, it's really quite fascinating. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. Dr. Heschel, thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Um, and I just want to applaud you for bringing your father into our lives. Um, I was lucky enough to hear you last year at Greensboro mm -hmm. College as well. So my question to you is this, um, having such a father, um, you know, is an amazing thing for a woman of your generation, of our generation. Um, so you're bringing him to us. Tell us how he has influenced your own work um, in the area of either civil rights, people suffering, um, how your work um, in school and around the world uh, has, influenced, has been influenced by your dad. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, um, I think I've been influenced by my father uh, every day and in every way. And I would say, first of all, that I was influenced by his personality, by his warmth and by his affection. You know, I'll just have to tell you one other thing that I learned from that evening, that last evening at the Concord Hotel. Um, after the evening was over and my father and Dr. King wanted to talk privately, and my father took me over to him, to, and he's, I had met him a few times, but he said, do you remember Susie? And Dr. King, at the end of a long day, a long evening, said, of course I remember Susie. Now, there's no reason for him to have remembered me. I was just a kid, just a nobody. But the fact that he gave me that gift of recognition like that is something that I treasure. And I think it's moments like that when we observe someone, my father was certainly like that, who always, even in a moment of exhaustion, and a moment, or a moment of tension or aggravation or frustration, can nonetheless be so generous and be so loving that's an extraordinary gift. My father was very much like that. So the love and the, and the compassion that I received from him was really um, the most important thing. And beyond that, my father studied all the time, he was always studying all the time. He, and he didn't mind if I walked into his study and he was writing in the middle of writing, he would drop his pen and welcome me with enormous warmth. Our house was full of learning and study and interesting discussions. His friends were all European refugee scholars. The fact is that the most frequently discussed book was probably Max Weinreich's book called Hitler's Professors. My father and his friends would sit around talking about the professors they had worked with in Germany before the war, and how this one had become a Nazi, and that one, et cetera, et cetera, and how it was so unpredictable. So yes, it's probably not a coincidence that I then wrote a book about a group of Protestant theologians who, had, who became Nazis, who supported Hitler, um, influenced by those conversations I heard at the dinner table. I think the other thing is that my father, uh, and, and let, let me just say something else. I looked at Dr. King's papers from when he was in seminary that were published, and you know, there are many volumes published of his papers by Claiborne Carson. And in those papers in seminary, this is what struck me. After working, writing two books about the history of Protestant theology in Germany, especially Protestant New Testament scholarship, which was really the greatest in the world and that was brought over to the United States, you know, Dr. King's papers, when he talks about Jesus and his relationship to Judaism, his papers are amazing. He never says, the way all the, the German scholars were teaching, he never says, Jesus was opposed to Judaism. He never says Jesus was opposed to the Jews or you know, came to demolish Judaism the way the Christian New Testament scholars said. Dr. King in his papers was always saying Jesus was a Jew. This was not a question. You know, he was part of the Jewish world, a Jewish... 
And I have to say that I find that really extraordinary, uh, that already as a seminary student, yeah, he was going against the grain of what was the common accepted way of writing in New Testament scholarship in those days. So I learned from him, from those papers, I learned from my father, think critically, go against the grain, be attracted by people who think critically, who have a new insight, who have a new question, and don't just repeat what you've been heard, what you've been told, what you've been taught. Yeah? Say something new. And that brought me to the figure of Abraham Geiger, whom I had heard about from my father, who was a 19th century scholar, and who had something very new to say all the time, who thought differently, who turned the tables, reversed the way people ordinarily think about Judaism, about Christianity, about Islam. That originality, that spark, that was very important to me. Politically, politically we have to always think critically. My father made it very clear to me what goes on in this country. It still goes on. People sometimes say to me, what would your father say today politically? As if what, it's changed so much? Don't we have the same issues? Look what's going on in this country. Remember when President Obama was first elected and people said, now we live in a post-racial society? Come on. Look what happened. Look at the explosion of racism that's been unleashed in this country since his election and of course before, but really it's intensified. That's extraordinary. Why, I mean, I, you know what every, all of us are thinking, that why wasn't, why wasn't Duncan, Mr. Duncan, admitted to that hospital in Dallas? Hmm? I'd like to know why. Was it really a medical judgment or was it because he didn't have insurance? Because he was black? Tell me the reason, I wanna know the reason. What's going on? That should be a lesson to us. Yeah. And of course, conditions are getting worse here. We live in this age of neoliberalism. You know what it is? Everybody is supposed to be a, an entrepreneurial project. Everybody's an entrepreneur. Your whole self is to be an entrepreneurial project. You know, you work it yourself. You have to show yourself to the, be eager, to have a will to succeed, that you go to the gym, that you have self-control, that you do all of these things, right? And you work on yourself. What happened to the inner life, to the spiritual life? What happened also to happiness, to pleasure, to joy? Yeah, why, are we, why are we living like that? What does it mean to be religious in this entrepreneurial age? What does it mean to speak about religious values, about justice and about compassion and sensitivity, about making a scar in your heart for other people? When everybody's an entrepreneurial project like that, to be successful, to look successful, to pretend to be successful, to make other people think you're successful, and that's your achievement? So we need to pause, yeah? And I think that the issues are indeed the same, and what they had to say then, we have to say it again today. So from my father, I learned that we have to be engaged, we have to be involved, we have to care, and we have to work very hard, and we have to change things, and we have to speak out, and we have to stop being afraid, and it's hard not to be afraid because we're living in a dangerous era, a dangerous, <laughs> dangerous era for many reasons. The government is listening. It's a dangerous era, yeah. So, yes? Hi, um, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious, you, talk, you spoke about how your father spoke out for racial equality and also the um, Jewish faith, um, but if and how so did he speak out for you know, equality for other religions? Because as we know in America, there's many stigmas towards other religions, such as Muslims or you know, Asian religions. So how, how did he call for equality in those aspects? That's a great question. So my father actually wrote an essay that I think is it's a short essay. I think it's really wonderful. And it's called No Religion is an Island. You think about the image of an island, a little island in the middle of a big ocean, you know. No religion is an island, and what does he mean by that? He means that, in fact, religions affect one another. They influence each other. You know, I'll just give you an example. They influence each other, but sometimes they don't want to admit it. That's the thing. So, for example, the Jews, even if they're really, really never go to the synagogue, et cetera, the one last thing that they might, when it is the anniversary of someone's death in the family, they light a candle, a candle that burns for 24 hours. Your side candle means the time of year, anniversary candle. Yeah, where does that come from? Hmm? Who lights a candle? 
on behalf of a dead soul of a family member? Well, they got it in 13th century Spain. That's where they got it. They took it over from the Catholics. They don't want to admit it. Nobody will say it. Don't tell anybody I said so, et cetera, because everybody wants to pretend that we have boundaries. This is the authentic Judaism. Nobody influenced us. But in fact, all those boundaries are permeable. Each religion influences the other. No religion is an island. And he also meant, and he said in that essay, if one religion does something that's not nice, that's really horrible, that's degrading, like Christians marching and saying that Jesus was a Nazi and Hitler is doing what Jesus wanted, something horrible like that, that's a degradation of Christianity. But when Christianity is degraded like that, all faith becomes degraded, is held in contempt. People hold it in contempt. They say, why should anybody be religious if this is how religious people behave? So the degradation of one religion also affects another. So no religion is an island. But there's yet another meaning, which means a no religion is an island mean you can't just be religious in your little room, in your mind, in your heart and soul. No, you can't be an island. You have to go out in the world and do something with it. And isn't that the lesson of the civil rights movement, which was, in fact, one of the great religious movements that the world has ever seen? So no religion can be an island. Go ahead. Hi. <laughs> it happens to me every time. OK, so you said you referred to your father as a prophetic man. And you mentioned, um, forgive me if I'm wrong, but that the mark of a prophet is to um, open one's heart and allow the scar and to um, take the concern of man and God as uh, unified. Mm -hmm. So with that uh, thought, it's beautiful. Uh, would you say that we all have the potential for prophecy? Yes. And how would you go about to cultivating that potential? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it'd be kind of cool. Uh -huh. How would you cultivate that? I think that's a very beautiful question. I'm not sure that there's a formula or a prescription uh, that anyone can provide, or that there's one path to all people. But I think what's important here is to emphasize that what, when the prophet speaks out, when you hear the prophetic word, you're hearing a voice of compassion, ultimately. It may be expressed in righteous indignation, because anger is not a bad thing always. It depends what you do with it. Yeah? But the prophet speaks out, for one thing speaks out. So the prophet feels fiercely, but also has a voice and gives it a voice. There are many ways to be a prophet and to speak out. You can speak out also by marching. Yeah? You can speak out sometimes, you know, in a still small voice in a gentle way with another human being, like that Rebbe that I mentioned to you, just by listening with an open heart. That's a great gift too. But you can also have a loud voice in the society and speak out with courage. I would just say that I think, though, what's also important, Dr. King was a model of how to speak effectively. He was very restrained. And I can't imagine how hard that must have been, because I saw some old clips of television interviews where people asked him things. And I can imagine he was thinking, or I was thinking, Ugh, how can they ask him that? How can they say that? Ugh. That's what I thought. But he was very calm, and he responded in a very gracious way, even to things that were you know, really inappropriate. That graciousness also made him very effective. He was able to control himself and to be extremely effective in that way, yeah? and not just burst out and say whatever you want to say at a given moment. And that I respect very much and admire very much. Nobody else wants to ask me anything? Go ahead, please. Jacob's heard about your father, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And I told them we were coming tonight, and we talked a bit about <laughs> what this was about. But we talked about you as well. And then he said, so we're going to see the lecture from Mary. Maybe cousins don't even have a much much book. I'm trying to be related to you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. And I'm curious. You've done so many extraordinary things, we all know, and so did your father, too. And as we connected to it, you connected in one direction, talking about your father. I'm curious with all the amazing things that you've done. What do you think your father would be most proud of? <laughs> or pick one of the top. Um, you know, I, I actually, I'll tell you, um, um, Michael Prisciel and I were talking earlier about which one of us is more cranky. <laughs> and I was claiming, I was claiming that I am more cranky than Michael. <laughs> and by the, <laughs> but, you know, um, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine, Joshua Halberstam, once was a, a graduate student in, in the field of philosophy. Very proud of himself, young man. And he went to see my father, and he told my father that he was working in logical positivism. You know, A.J. Ayer? Very passe. You know, they, we, we had to read him in graduate school. It was really, uh. But anyway, logical positivism. Very, very clever, but ultimately doesn't add up to much. And my father said to him, don't choose a topic just because it's clever. Study something that you really believe in, that really means something to you. I think that that's in many ways very difficult in academic life. I think we sometimes, all of us, me too, write about things that are clever. We have something clever to say, not necessarily because they really are deeply meaningful. I would hope, I hope very much that this will become a world where people do choose to devote themselves to something that's meaningful to them, very deeply meaningful, and that makes a difference. For me, I think my father would have been, I think my father, I wish more than anything, I wish my father could read my book on Abraham Geiger, because I loved Geiger. I thought he was amazing, 19th century historian, and because I love what I did with him in my book. I just enjoyed it enormously. The book on the Nazis, ugh, who wants to read about Nazis? Horrible, you know? I'm glad it's over. I never will do it again. I don't know how people can bear to write about Nazis. I started out by working on feminist issues. And for me, that was an important problem, even in my childhood. And I'll just conclude by telling you maybe the story I told you earlier. Shall I tell them about the bar mitzvah? OK, so I grew up in a very religious home. I was sent to an Orthodox day school. And men and women sat separately at the synagogue service that we attended at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And in fact, when I was a little girl, it was permissible for little girls to sit with their fathers. So I was able to sit next to my father, which was very nice for me, until one day when I was about, I don't know, six or seven, the women from the women's side, who were the older women, actually, a group of them elderly kind of came over to me and they said, you can't sit there anymore, you're too big. You have to come and sit over there. And you know, just a few years ago, it suddenly occurred to me, why did they put it that way? Scolding, angry, why did they say, come, we would like you to come and sit with us in a warm, friendly way when you speak to a child, no? But no, it was. Anyway, when I was about 11, I decided I wanted to have a bat mitzvah. There was no such thing for girls at that time, no. It didn't exist. And I wanted it on Shabbat morning in a synagogue, and I wanted to read. I didn't even ask to read from the Torah, because that was like going to the moon. You don't ask it. It was just impossible. But I wanted to read the Haftorah, the prophetic text. 
this was a big thing. My father invited the chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary to tea one Shabbat afternoon, and he sat down, and my parents let me do the talking. And I said to him, tell me, what do you think of Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement? Because that was the point of reference. <laughs> and he spoke with great pride. Oh, Martin Luther King is very great. And I invited him to the seminary, and I gave him an honorary degree, and I support the Civil Rights Very important movement. Blah, blah. And when he finished, blah, 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 yeah. Then I said to him, so you believe in equality? I want a bat mitzvah. <laughs> And he said, OK, we'll make a party at my home. We'll have cookies and punch. I said, cookies and punch? <laughs> no. So anyway, my father arranged a bat mitzvah for me in another synagogue. And it was all very nice, except that the faculty members were in a quandary. Should they honor their colleague and come to the bat mitzvah? But how can they go there? Because even though their lives are spent as professors at a seminary to train conservative rabbis, they would never pray in a conservative synagogue where men and women sit together. OK. So at any rate, I um, went from there to ultimately publish a book on, on Jewish feminism, on being a Jewish feminist. And feminist issues are something that were very important to me. And I'm deeply grateful that my father supported me all along the way and showed me, showed me the right path and showed me that there is a commitment to religion and to piety and to religiosity on the one hand, but you can't spoil it by having this kind of um, treatment of women that keeps women you know, behind a curtain or out of sight or simply in a secondary position. That's not piety. If it's so important, then we should also be part of it. So I think my father would have been pleased by that. And I know that I was inspired by him, by his political vision, by his religious vision, and by his personal enthusiasm and support for me always. And so I would say my father was a very well-loved child by his mother, by his three older sisters who all doted on him. And he was, in turn, an extremely loving father to me. And so whatever I write, whatever I do, it's thanks to that gift that I received from him as a human being, as a father, and, uh, and for what he's given to all of you also. So I thank you all very much for coming tonight. Thank you.